have more here. Just, would somebody like one? Okay, I'll send them back there, and they're always in the pocket in the hallway if you have a friend that wants to pick one up. Um, I think I, we need to fill it, fill it up a little bit more. I'll tell Michelle, but anyway. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy and have you welcome you today to Books Between Bites. Thank you, Becky. Um, I'm Stacy Peterson, the Adult Services Manager here at the library, and we're delighted that Julie Olazak is here with us today. She was an elementary school teacher for 20 years and now devotes her time to writing. She's the author of two books, The Fifth Floor and Just Like Ziggy. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Education from Northern Illinois University and a Master of Arts in Education from National Lewis University. In addition to writing, Julie enjoys public speaking, which is good news for us today, as well as listening to audiobooks and traveling. She lives here in Batavia with her husband, Mike, and dog, Bo. Please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Julie Olasek. Thank you, Stacy. Um, and I want to start also by thanking Betty, and whose husband start, started this foundation, and Becky, her daughter. And I know George was in here earlier, but I don't see him now. And Stacy also, who has also um, this, uh, is going to nominate me for soon to be famous author that is next year. So I'm very excited about that. And also, for, I want to thank uh, Rosemary Hunters over there because I saw an email come through about, I don't know, maybe six months ago, and she had emailed the library saying, you know, I just heard Julie speak. I think you should have her at Books Between Bites. So if not for her, maybe I wouldn't be here. So I'm very glad to be here. So thank you. And um, well, we'll get started. Anyways, like Stacy said, I do have two books. I have um, The Fifth Floor and Just Like Ziggy. I'm going to be talking mostly about my, about my debut novel, which is The Fifth Floor. But I'll talk a little bit about Just Like Ziggy and then a little bit of a surprise ending, too. So, moving on. Stacy said all the, uh, said most of this already, but I am the ninth child of ten. Here, let me use this instead. I am the ninth child of ten. Um, I grew up in the Chicagoland area, and I live in Batavia with my husband Mike. Can you hear? And um, also my dog Bo. And I don't have in there my cat Peyton, which I should, because really Peyton the cat runs the house. <laughs> and also I do. I went um, to college for teaching, which I did for 20 years. So, but the things Stacy didn't mention are the real me. So the real me is that um, I am a lover of animals, all animals. And don't be grossed out because I wash my hands often, but I am, have been known to pick up worms off the sidewalk after a rain so they get back to the dirt and not die. So for you animal lovers out there, you'd understand that. But um, I am younger than eight, older than one, aunt of many, and mother of none. I'm an obsessor of audiobooks. I don't know if any of you do this but I will literally get to a parking lot and I will listen to the final chapter. And um, I find myself doing that quite often. Uh, I am a reader of just about anything, except that I'm not a big sci-fi reader and I'm not a big fantasy reader. So that's not what the fifth floor and just like Ziggy are, of course. Um, I am an adventure seeker. That is me in the uh, jumping out of an airplane. And I seem to have been much more into adventure and risk-taking in my younger days, in my 30s, in my 20s and 30s, and not so much anymore. It's like you get to the point where you just don't want to get hurt anymore. Um, I am a hostess of parties. I love to host parties. I am a traveler, a baker, a writer, and enjoyer of friends. I love to be with friends, um, and I try to go out with my former friends from teaching um, as often as I can. Is everything okay? I'm just going to move the mic. Okay, okay, no problem. It'll probably be easier if I use this too. So that's the real me. Now kind of study that slide because we're going to have some fun at the end. No homework, but just fun. Um, all right, so let's move on. My love for reading got a very late start. So late, I was actually in college when the love of reading happened. Um, reading was very painful for me as a child. My younger sister, who was four years younger, or who is four years younger, could read four books to my one. So of course, it being a struggle, it being painful just to even do, I didn't love it. I actually went to school though, college for elementary ed, and we had this assignment that kind of changed my life in reading. Because I was going to be an elementary school teacher, 
The assignment was we had to read 100 books. A percent of them had to be wordless picture books, picture books, middle school books, young adult books. Well, what happened to me when I started reading all these young adult books, I fell in love with them. Now, mind you, I'm 20 years old, and I'm reading books like, you know, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, and Mark Twain, and The Secret Garden. I mean, things that I should have read long ago. And I kept going back to the library, pretending I had to get more books for this class, as I'm like grabbing all these young adult books, or middle school books, that I absolutely fell in love with. And in college, that's when my uh, reading started, and it never stopped. From that point forward, then I started going to get classics. I started getting books that people would recommend. And it's never stopped, and I can't stop reading from that point forward, but um, it got a very, very late start. And I always say the exceptional literature moves us for me. I know that if I can cry or laugh with the, the characters, then that is a book that I absolutely love. But my love for writing got a very early start. This is the earliest book that I could find. I actually have it up here. I wrote it when I was 11 years old to my niece who was just born. Well, she was one year at the time. And the dedication page actually says to Jennifer Lynn, um, and it has the date, and I wrote and illustrated this book, and it was one of the first books I have. But even more than that, um, my love for writing, even though I couldn't read, I could read my own writing, right? So they say that reading and writing goes together. Well, in my case, it was a little separated, but it got a very early start. And here's the writing assignment and teacher that changed everything for me for writing. I love to write since I was a little girl. I had poetry back when I was seven years old. Uh, but when I was in the seventh grade, that's my teacher, Mrs. Collins, and that's her picture from the yearbook. She gave a writing assignment to the class, and the writing assignment was we needed to choose a piece of nature and write about that. And I chose the Redwood Forest, had never been there, but I chose, um, I chose to write about it because every day, almost every day the summer before, there was a huge old oak tree down at what we call the little park in our neighborhood. And I actually used to bring my sack lunch there by myself, climb up in the tree and eat my lunch there, and just kind of look out onto the world. So when I wrote, chose the Redwood Forest, I had all that passion in my mind to write about what it was that I was seeing, even though I was choosing the Redwood Forest. And I was a very quiet child. Um, I didn't say boo. I didn't look at a teacher cross-eyed, but no one did back then. And I wrote about the Redwood Forest. Wood Forest, and out of all the kids, Mrs. Collins chose my piece to read aloud. And she talked about what, how the wonderful writing it was, that I was a talented writer. Now, I could have been or not. I don't know, but it didn't matter. It's what she said. Um, and it changed everything for me. And from that point forward, just like the books in college, I just kept reading. I just started writing. And it's funny because as I was looking for slides for this, I went through and was looking at, you know, stuff that I had written. And some of the, th I was rereading and I was thinking, what was I thinking when I was writing this? But, um, I mean, one down there is from 1987. Um, the poem on the top, Jenny's Tree, is like three pages long. So these are just pieces of writing, but I've never stopped. I also keep tons of journals, too. So once again, my writing just got a kickstart because of an experience that I had. So I think we kind of feel that a lot of us, no matter what it is, something that we love, a lot of times it does get that jump start just by someone saying something or what, something positive. Um, and I have no idea why that slide is like that, but somehow we are drawn to the things we love. That's what it says. That is my father. Um, so maybe writing has a little bit of genetics to put in play here. He was the editor-in-chief of Le Moyne College newspaper for four years, published a short story for Sports Illustrated, and loved to write stories and poetry. It was not his full-time job. He was a regional sales manager for International Harvester that became Dresser that eventually became Komatsu. So um, he loved to write, and I remember many times him coming home from work, um, cracking, op cracking open a beer, and writing. And if he was in the mood, he would read out his poetry or his short story. But another thing about my father is he was a great storyteller. He had quick wit, and he was a great storyteller. Um, so he liked to do that. But otherwise, he was very quiet. But when it came to his writing, it was a different story. And that's kind of the same with me. I'm usually very quiet. But when it comes to writing, uh, I put a lot of emotion and passion into it. For me, 
Um, I'm not really sure my father's internal reasons for writing, but I could imagine maybe it was the same as it is for me. So why do I love to write? It's because of the three C's. Communicate, I can't stop myself, and I'm compelled to tell a story. <coughs> so communicate. I am a much better writer than I am presenter. You may or may not believe that right now, I don't know. But um, I love to communicate through words. Um, I always, like I struggled in reading as a child through school. I struggled as a student also. Um, and that kept me very quiet. So through my writing, I could communicate with really myself or just get my feelings and emotions out. I can never stop myself from thinking of ideas and characters. And this is, goes way back. I remember telling stories to kids in first and second grades um, that were just, you know, stories, made up stories. And, um, and I'm compelled to tell a story and finish it throughout. So I like to have readers reading my story. So that's uh, the three C's, that communicate, can't stop, and compel. Kind of study that screen. So becoming a writer, from teacher to writer, like Stacy said, I was a teacher for 20 years. Um, I've always been writing, but the last five years of teaching, I really started writing more professionally, wanting to get a book out there. So with teaching, anyone here a teacher? Okay, or was a teacher? Okay, so you know you can't have two loves. You either teach 70 to 80 hours a week, and you go home and fall in bed exhausted, and just pray for Saturday morning, um, but it takes a long time to write. But I did, in my last couple of years of teaching, I did start a book that I'm going to be talking about called The Fifth Floor. I got to 20 years purposefully, just because that changes in your pension a little bit, but, um, but I had planned to resign after 20 years, which I got to 20 years and I did do that. So, and that's me at my little tiny writing desk um, that I had upstairs on the, when I would write on the weekends for maybe an hour or two. So the first book took me a little bit longer because I was teaching while I was doing it. So for writing full time, um, ideas come from anywhere. As anyone up, anyone in here um, write? Do, do you write or interested in writing? Yeah, so you know ideas can come from anywhere. I mean, literally I'll get a street name, I'll just all of a sudden see a street name and I'll be like, oh, that's a great street name. Or I'll hear someone's name and I'll be like, what a great character name. So it comes from everywhere. And I'm not saying I eavesdrop like at cafes or places, but sometimes conversations <laughs> even be can become part of your story. Um, and then you just hope maybe they don't read it. But uh, I ask myself, is my idea important to me? And if it is, great. If it's not, I'm not going to be passionate about it. I also, will someone want to read the story I want to write? So even though I may love an idea, will the audience, will the reader love the idea? So I need to make sure I step back and ask myself that. And can I write a whole book about it? Um, for those few writers in the crowd, for me, I have so many great beginnings and then find that I really can't make a whole story out of this. So that's another thing that I have to ask myself. So those three questions are things that are important in writing a novel. So when I start a new novel, I have to make sure those questions can be answered. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about The Fifth Floor. The Fifth Floor actually began as a story called Growing Up Nine. So I had this idea, like I talked about, I got an idea that it would be very intriguing, I think, to readers to hear about what it was like to grow up in a large family. Anyone here in a large family, six kids or more? Okay, how many? Six kids, okay. How many? Six. Six. All right. How many? I have seven. So you have seven, so that's a large family, yes. So and back there, Ruth? Eight. eight. Are you, you have eight children or you're one of eight? I have eight. You have eight, okay. So I am one of ten, so my mom had ten kids. Um, so I thought I'm going to start, I'm going to have this story called Growing Up Nine. Nine, because I'm the ninth child and nine because I never felt like a 10, if you know what that means. Um, so I thought, what a great book, you know? When you're in a large family, you don't ever feel like top of the line or that you're ever good enough and things like that. Um, but then an inner voice began because there was a little bit of a problem. If you grow up in a large family, you really grow up in a couple groups. You don't grow up as one unit. You might, if you grow up in 10, maybe there's three units. For me, I really felt like there was two units, the older seven and the younger three. So this voice began, I wanted to talk and write a story about growing up 10, but I had no idea about my older siblings. I mean, I started writing it and I was like, 
I really don't have a clue what their life entailed. So the inner voice began, and I knew I had to write what I know. And what I knew were the younger three. I grew up the middle child of the younger three. So that was kind of a separate group. So there's Anna and Liz, and there's Bridget over to the right, <coughs> or over to the left, excuse me. Um, so I wanted to write what I knew. So my new idea emerges, but not without challenges. So this was the deal. I did grow up with my, my uh, other two sisters, partially. There was a tragedy that happened in my family when I was seven years old, something that no one talked about, something that I had not talked about, but something that I knew very well, I was very passionate about. Um, I had everything inside. I had written about things in my journals, but no one had ever seen them. So in writing this story called The Fifth Floor, if I'm going to tell my life of growing up the youngest of three, I knew that it was going to entail telling things that would make me um, passionate about what I was going to write. It was going to probably want the reader to read it. Um, so I had to make some decisions. But it didn't really come that easy. I thought to myself, just start writing it, Julie. Just start writing it and deal with the other stuff later. So I started writing The Fifth Floor, and I got to the part of when I was a teenager and had some trouble, uh, suffered actually, from a nervous breakdown because of an incident, a tragedy that had happened in our lives earlier when I was seven years old. So the challenge was, no one knew this, no one. I taught for 20 years, not a soul knew it. No one did because we didn't talk about it. Plus that was the time, you know, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, you just didn't talk about things anyways. But it was more secretive in my family than anything. Um, so I just thought, write it. And then I wrote it. And then I was like, okay, should I put this out there? And then some of my siblings, I said, I'll just test it on my siblings, see what they say. And they're like, yeah, you gotta put it out there. So there was challenges with putting something like the fifth floor out there. So at this point in time, I am going to read part of chapter three for you to give you kind of an idea of the voice um, of the earlier chapters. And then I'll read later, I'll read a little bit from where the book unfolds, the fifth floor and why the title came about. But the fifth floor begins in 1972 when at the age of five, Anna, the ninth child of 10, is, carefree and is a carefree and energetic little girl. She loves the constant commotion of her large family. She craves attention, attention, adventure, and fun. So that's a kite flying with my siblings. There's the blue station wagon that in the chapter I'll talk about in just a minute. And I am on the bottom here. And then my sister Frances, who is in this chapter, is also, um, she's on the top there. So I'm going to read a little bit of this. And even though the year begins, the book begins in 1972, um, Anna is six in this chapter. So let's see if I can. So this is just the, be this is just the beginning of chapter three. Ten children, my teacher says. She's astonished after I tell her my sister Frances is coming for me after school today. She asks how old my sister is, and when I tell her 19, it leads to more questions. It's the end of March, and until now, Mrs. Kinney hasn't been interested in finding out anything about me. She likes me. It's just she likes the kids who sleep during nap time better. I never sleep during nap time, and I feel sorry for the kids who do because they miss out on imagining things like flying kites and swinging and climbing trees. How many girls and how many boys in your family? Six girls and four boys. Now, let's see, she says holding up five fingers on one hand and her thumb on the other. Six plus four more. Ten. Ten. I want to shout. I hear my mother's voice inside my head. Patience is a virtue. But I can't help myself. Ten, I say, thinking Mrs. Kinney should know by now that six plus four equals ten. Can you name them all? What a dumb question, some of my siblings would have said. But I act like it's not dumb so I don't hurt my teacher's feelings. Yes. I, said, I say instead, Francis, Jim, Gabe, Meg, Marie, Kyle, Timmy, Liz, me, and Bridge. Bridge? Mrs. Kinney questions, scrunching her nose, showing me she is confused. Her real name is Bridget, but we call her Bridge. The two and a half hours it takes for kindergarten to end is like watching molasses drip. But eventually, I'm packing up my reader and heading out the door to look for Francis. I feel like a big shot waving, my waving to my classmates as they step onto the bus without me. 
I see Francis pull up in my mother's blue station wagon. I run to it, happy to hop into the front seat with all the kids looking out the bus windows, probably wondering how I got so lucky to have an older sister who can drive. How about McDonald's for lunch? Francis, Francis asks. Yes! I had been to McDonald's once before, and dreaming of eating french fries again is just too much, and french fries are all I want by the time I get to the counter. That's all? No hamburger? Francis says. I shake my head, indicating I want only fries. It may be never until I eat McDonald's again. My mom believes in vegetables and fruits and making her own bread, not french fries. How's kindergarten? Good, I say, pulling up. Good, I say, pulling a long fry from its back. Nice, from its bag. Nice teacher? Mm-hmm. Frances left for college last August before I started kindergarten, so she doesn't know how, so she doesn't know much about it. By the time Frances and I arrive home, my mother has already started cooking dinner. I run up front, up the front steps through the living room and into the kitchen. Mom is skinning apples. I take hold of one peel from the huge pile in front of her, and because my mom can skin an apple without breaking the peel, I know it's going to be extra long. I lift it high above my mouth and lower it in, chewing as it enters. Francis hangs the car keys on the hook that's screwed into the side of one of the cabinets and turns down the hallway to her room, probably to try on her wedding dress again. She's getting married in June, and she's tried it on a hundred times since she got home from school two days ago. Bridge is in her duck rocker. She is too and really cute when she's happy. She has brown wispy curls at the end of each straight strand of hair that bounces when she runs. Ever since she learned how to run less than a month ago, it's the only thing she wants to do. Even now she's squirming, wanting to get out from underneath the strap holding her to her seat. Rock her, Anna, my mother says, pouring the apples and cutting the pieces into quarters. Bridges Rocker has a large plastic duck on each side of a wooden seat. The duck's feet make up the runners. I sit on my butt, lean back, and prop myself up on my hands. Placing my feet on the wooden bar that stretches across one duck foot to another, I rock the duck in short, quick burst, making Bridge laugh until she's had enough. Mom, she wants to get out, I yell, trying to pull her out myself. My mom takes over and I follow Frances into the bathroom and stand on the commode lid and watch her brush her long blonde hair. She pulls it back, lifts it up, and then lets it fall, brushing it again before she places her veil on her head. How are you going to wear it? I'm not sure yet, she replies, taking mascara from her makeup bag. She pumps the tiny brush back and forth to load it up with blackness. She stares into the mirror, raising her eyebrows and opening her mouth as she applies coat after coat. Her eyes are so pretty, they are see-through blue, like the stained glass windows in church. I look in the mirror at my brown eyes. I wish I had blue eyes. Frances picks up a straight pin and begins separating each eyelash so they are not clumped together. You have the only brown eyes in the family. That's kind of cool. I smile because Frances is right. The front door opens then shuts with a loud slam. Open shuts, open shuts. My older brothers and sisters are arriving home from school and the slamming of the front door is always the first sign of the commotion about to begin. As soon as Liz gets home, she takes my place in the bathroom because Liz has as much fun with Francis as I do with Gabe. When can I visit you in Maine? Remember, mom said I could, Liz says to Francis. In a couple of years, I promise, Francis says, looking at Liz through the mirror and adjusting her veil. Liz giggles with excitement, I can't wait. The doorbell rings and I run to see who's here. Four girls are standing outside the door wanting to know if Gabe is home. No, I say, as soon as I close the door and run upstairs to my parents' bedroom window to watch their next move. They walk down the driveway looking disappointed and then gather on the sidewalk pretending to be minding their own business. But I know what they're waiting for, Gabe's return. If he sees them, he'll spend time with them instead of me. It's okay to be the center of attention around Gabe's buddies, but when it comes to girls, I follow a different set of unspoken rules. Gabe makes girls laugh by doing nothing but opening his mouth. He'll laugh and then they'll laugh and he'll laugh, he'll laugh and then they'll laugh. And then he'll push his dirt bike from the garage so the girls can gather closer. He'll race up and down the street, each girl getting a ride and a, and a turn to tightly squeeze their arms around Gabe's strong middle. It's all a bit dramatic. I mumble, watching the girls stand around waiting for my brother to come home. I like it better when Gabe hangs when boy with boys because pretty girls have a way of making me go unnoticed. When they finally leave, I head outside, hoping Gabe will be home soon and that he hasn't stopped at a friend's house first. 
Gabe is 17, and because I am six, he is able to toss me about like a baseball. When he chases me through the house, I scream with excitement, trying to stay one step ahead of him. And when he catches me, he grabs me by the ankles. Come on, Anna, he says. Stand as straight as a board. With a strong grip around my ankles, he flips me upside down, my head hanging inches above the floor. There's an occasional bump or bruise causing me to hold my head or grasp my leg, hopping in circles from pain, but I rarely cry. Crying is for weaklings, and older siblings find names for criers, one like faker or chicken, both of which I hate. Gabe and three of his friends round the corner, all holding sandwiches. He is taller than the others, and the only one in the group with dark brown wavy hair. So he's easy to pick out, even from five houses away. I wait patiently on the sidewalk until he's close enough to notice me. Hey, big rat, run and get us mustard, Gabe says, and off I run, happy for the attention. When I return, Gabe lifts me, lifts me from underneath my arms, swinging me about, causing my legs to dart out, hitting his friends. They try to catch my legs to avoid impact, but I move just in time, so they miss. Way to go, big rat. So that gives you kind of an idea. That's chapter three, and it gives you kind of an idea of this of Anna and her carefree spirit, and even the carefree spirit of her siblings, too. So um, that kind of gives you the idea, an idea of the voice, I should say. Um, okay, so moving on. So the event is in 1974, so two years after that chapter I just read. So in 1974, Anna is the sole witness of a tragic event that she will internalize as her fault. For 10 years, Anna will keep her secret of what really happened on that fateful November day. So there's an event that happened, a tragedy that happens, um, and here's Francis with the three youngest, Liz, Bridget, and Anna. And after that tragic event, the three youngest, as we were called, we became simply known as the little girls. So my younger sister and I became known as the little girls instead of the three youngest because, of course, one of them is missing. Liz is missing. So that's the event that happens. The premise of the story of the fifth floor. So the premise is the tragic event that Anna experiences will antagonize her for 10 years before she gives up hope. So if you hear in that chapter, her voice, it's very playful, she's very carefree, she just loves all the commotion of her family. So we have from age seven to now 17. So what in the heck has happened in these 10 years? And this is where the story really begins to unfold. So the place, now it's 1984, it's 10 years later. As the fifth floor unfolds, 10 years after the family tragedy, Anna, 17 and withdrawn, is sent to a psychiatric ward on the fifth floor of Advocate Hospital. While there, she begins to experience flashbacks of the family crisis and her role in the tragic incident. So now I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs. It's not a long chapter, but just a couple paragraphs so you can hear the difference in voice. Um, and this begins, I believe, chapter... So Anna is 17 at the time, chapter 12. Getting ready for school today is no different. So let me back up a little bit. She's 17, she's a junior in high school. Getting ready for school today is no different than yesterday, except today I decide I just can't go on like this any longer. In the closed bathroom, I sit on the edge of the tub trying to pull my pajama shirt up and over my head, but I can't. Exhausted by the mere effort of trying, I lower it back around me. I think of what today will bring, Working against disappointments and failures will take strength. It's all too much to think about. Placing my head in my hands and knowing I have nothing left to offer, I simply give in to my weakness. Anna, my mom calls from outside the bathroom door, and when I don't answer, oops, I lost my place, I'm sorry. And when I don't answer, she lets herself in. She finds me drooped on the side of the tub. I look up at her. I can't do it anymore, I whisper. Pulling myself up from the tub side, I slowly slink down the hallway and into my room where I lie down. Hanging half off my bed, I sleep. I don't go to school today, or tomorrow, or the day after, simply because I can't. I haven't eaten in over 20 days, not a single bite. That's how I ended up in Dr. Ellison's office on a cold March day with a choice of going peacefully to the hospital or taking a stand against this resistance. She didn't give me a choice to go home and die, maybe because I am drained, or maybe I sense that this is my last shred of hope. Whatever the reason, I go quietly without a fight. We arrive at the hospital, walk into the lobby, and then take the elevator up to the fifth floor. 
The elevator wall traps me. The elevator walls trap me, and by the time the door opens, I am lightheaded and my knees are weak. I am helped to a couch in the waiting area. I put my head forward in my hands. I attempt to lean my head back, but I fall down sideways across the couch. I am aware of voices around me, but I see nothing, smell nothing, and feel nothing. A quick spark flashes inside my head, or maybe it's on the wall. I close my eyes, wanting everything to disappear, but another flash appears, triggering a memory of long ago. I stare at the open gate. Continue on, my voice echoes, but instead of fading into the distance, my voice grows louder until my ears fill with loud telephone wire-like buzzing. My heart tightens as the only pine tree on the grounds comes into view. 21 steps past the pine tree and eight steps to the left and I will be at Liz's grave site. I have counted it many times on our weekly visits here after church, Bridge and me and my parents. My head begins to hurt. The tightness in my chest is so severe I stop at step 12 and allow myself to breathe. I look around the grounds. Bridge pulls at my hand, coaxing me to play. She doesn't understand. So we skip about turning cart cartwheels and somersaults in the grass. We run to and from the statue of Jesus and race each other to the water pump where our father fills water for Liz's flowers, water jugs for Liz's flowers. Just steps away, a glint, sun a glint of sunlight shining off the polished granite stone catches my eye. I fall to my hands and knees and gently run my hand over its smooth surface. I sit back on the grass, hugging my knees to my chest. The stone fades, then the water pump. I look to the statue. The sun shines brightly behind it, and then it too fades into the distance. Muffled voices of what sounds like an army of people in a panic surround me. Their voices grow louder. My ears hum, my chest and head release their pain, and I am engulfed in complete darkness. So that kind of gives you an idea just a few chapters later, five chapters later or so, seven chapters, of the voice. So obviously this 10 years has passed. Anna's keeping a secret, which I'm not going to reveal. It's part of the book, uh, but she's keeping the secret that she has held and uh, she can no longer go on with her life. So this is what the fifth floor is about. And this is why when I started to write the story based on a true story, um, I had to think about a lot. Could I put this out there? So now the plot, now the real story begins, right? So we're on chapter 12, I think out of 60 chapters, and it's all about the fifth floor. So on the fifth floor of Advocate Hospital, Anna's decade-long tailspin is about to get worse. So what must Anna do to survive? Who is she up against? What will happen if she loses? She must get help so she can heal, and will she? So those are the questions that I was even asking myself as I was formulating a plot. So 30, late, 30 years later, so why now? Well, I kind of <clears throat> talked about that. Um, it just wasn't something we talked about in our family of that um, more, I mean, for 30 years, basically, until my book came out. So it was a subject that I was going to broach that I had to be careful with, but I had to be honest with and um, write passionately about. And I did write it as fiction because I did want to put, I did want to entertain the readers as well. So uh, when I started thinking it was going to be a memoir, memoir, they have so many certain rules for that that I didn't want that. So I made it fiction, but it is based on a true story. Um, once again, so why now? Like I said earlier, not anyone I worked with, any of my friends even knew I had this, this life back 30 years earlier. Um, so from writer to author, and that's what the, the challenges and the struggles that I had. So I wrote the book. I didn't put it on the shelves anywhere though. I didn't put it online anywhere. I had the book. My siblings that I did give it to them to read, um, they said, yes, you don't get it out there. Then I gave it to people that, I gave it to a librarian. I gave it to um, a couple of good friends that I had. And just to kind of get like maybe an honest critique. And you know, I told them, please try not to be my friend because I didn't, I didn't want to give it to anyone I didn't know. I mean, so, um, but from point, a, I guess, to point Z, I decided to publish the book, and from that point forward, it's just never stopped moving forward. So it's been great. I've been speaking at high schools and middle schools, and it has just been, it's been wonderful. So right now, it's on the shelves of Anderson Bookshop and Townhouse Books and online. So it's, it's been great. So that was from writer to author. And then something interesting really happened. The Fifth Floor was actually written as a standalone novel. It was going to be the only novel based on this subject. I had already planned. I had already started, actually, a new novel. 
And about a couple months after I put the book out there, through my website, I was getting flooded with these emails from people saying what happened to the siblings, the other siblings. I mean, they went through this experience too. And so I put my second book that I had writing, I put it on hold, and I decided to write another book, just like Ziggy. And just like Ziggy was very interesting. It says, Anna must get her family to divulge their secret of past, but what is about to be uncovered is unforeseen. And that's very true. So I actually, this is another book based on a true story. So I gathered, well, not gathered up my siblings, but I either sent them an email or uh, made a phone call and I said, I'm thinking about writing this book, but I have no idea how you perceive this tragedy. I have no idea even how you grew up in this. Can I interview you? And it was amazing. Everyone said yes. Um, I even had one brother who I was interviewing who said, oh, I was not going to say this, I was not going to say this. And in the end I said, could I put it in the book because it was just so real. Um, we're not criers in our family. I had siblings who were crying either over the phone if they were long distance, um, emails that made me cry. I just had no idea. So once again, I made it into fiction. I wanted to make it entertaining for the reader, but I wanted uh, for the reader to understand the feelings that went behind this. So just like Ziggy is still, Anna is the narrator. Um, she's the basis of the story, but it is she begins to understand what happened to her siblings in this situation and her parents, but it's basically her siblings. So um, here meet the, the real life characters of the time of the incident. Here are Anna's, Anna's older sisters, Meg, Francis, and Marie, two are, uh, which are here today with me, Francis and Marie. Um, Anna's brothers, Jim, Gabe, Kyle, and Timmy. And then I have what's up with the character's name changes. This is the question I get asked a lot, actually, um, after they realize that the names of the characters have changed and it's based on a true story, why not use the real name of the characters? Uh, once again, I couldn't. Once I started writing The Fifth Floor, I had to separate myself from the actual story, believe it or not. It was so painful to go back into my past that I literally could not even put my own name into the book. Um, but at that point in time, when I was thinking about putting the book out there, I was glad I had done that. The reason why is because I thought, okay, now I'll just put the book out there and no one will know because I changed all the names. Yeah, that doesn't happen. Um, but anyways, that's what I did. And I actually, with a couple of my sisters, we painstakingly came up with the perfect names that we thought fit the characters. So it wasn't just, oh, name this person this or take all their middle names or anything like that. We, you know, Gabe is a very, Scott, my brother Scott, Gabe is a very, was a very fun, loving person and that just resonated with me as a very fun uh, and loving name. Um, Jim, I did keep his, the, his name the same. It just sounds like a soldier to me. I don't know why it just does, so I had to keep his name the same. And then of course Liz, the uh, middle of the bottom line there, I wanted to keep her name this, uh, the same to honor her in this book. So I didn't want to change her name, but the other ones are changed. Um, so, and the so, same readers um, that asked me what in the heck happened to Anna's siblings, in the same emails, they actually asked me about the fifth floor characters because the fifth floor is mainly Anna on the fifth floor and now she's dealing with other teens that are there. So they said they wanted to know about the fifth floor characters and I actually put them into Just Like Ziggy. And when it went to the editor, the uh, editor said, oh, no, 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 you've got two books in here. This is way too much. So they were separated out. And so coming this November, in just a few weeks, will be released. And no, I'm not telling you the title yet. It's coming out on my website. But coming soon, the unveiling of uh, the cover and the title. And in the third book of the Fifth Floor Trilogy, the patients of the Lock Psychiatric Ward of Advocate Hospital are reunited. So um, that was a really fun book to write, too. And that one, each book took about, the first took, book took two and a half years because I was teaching. The other two books each took a year because I write full time now. So um, I'm excited to put that book out, the next one. And, and like I said, The Fifth Floor was written as a standalone. Uh, I never expected this to even turn into this, so it's been exciting. And now I'm on my fourth book and it has nothing to do with this. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, in, the, in this third book that's coming out, sorry about that mishap on there, in the novel, the readers will discover if any, has anyone um, read, well, and I won't ask you, but if you've read The Fifth Floor, you know on The Fifth Floor, Anna um, is given a, a gift 
of a book, To Kill a Mockingbird, by Ben. And we are in the third book. You find out why this gift has been so important. And it's, it's in the second book as well. But we find out. And at the bottom, you can see To Kill a Mockingbird. That's the actual book that the character gave to me. And I have cherished that ever since. And I've read it like five or six times. Just it's something with me. Every time I move to a new house, I have to read that book. I don't know why, but that's what it is. And that's why I've read it so much. But um, that is the, the, the book that I received from him. And in the fifth floor, there's a passage from To Kill a Mockingbird, um, from the actual book, to my book, which, of course, I had to get all sorts of permissions for. And I thought that was never going to happen, but I was given permission. I think it came out to be 67 words that I took from To Kill a Mockingbird. And that, that took about a, well, I got the permission for the United States in like six months. But for the UK or anywhere outside the United States, I didn't get permission for almost two years. So I couldn't even sell the fifth floor in uh, anywhere outside the United States, but now I can, so I have permission for that too. So and that's that in that third book. And then, yes, I try to block up, block the cover there. Um, I am at Marmy and Christmas Craft Show this year in the Tea Tree. I'll do a book signing there, and it's my website. But let's move on. So before you ask me, let me ask you. So those are the kind of slides I told you to study, remember? So let's see. Let's have some fun, the real me. Can anyone name three things that the real me really enjoys? The outdoors. The outdoors. The animals. animals. Audio books. Audio books. Writing. Writing. Okay, I'm going, you had two. So I'm going to give you a free book. And if you, and if you already have one, you can give it to a friend or save it for someone else. So, now these questions get a little harder as I move on. And the fun continues. Why do I write? What three C's motivate this writer? Communicate. Communicate. Can't stop. Compelled. Compelled. Okay, I'm not sure. Did anyone answer two on that one? At least two? Well, how about I give it to you? Right here in the yellow. I know that you shouted out one of them anyway. So there's a free book for you. Two more questions and then I promise we're done. Um, <laughs> Okay, Gabe has a nickname for Anna. What is it? Rat. Big rat. rat, you got it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now this next one is a triply hard one. So you get the set of books if you can get it. Don't yell at me too fast. And lastly, name five of Anna's siblings. <laughs> Anyone? You want to try? Okay. Character and those siblings, right? Characters in the book. Okay. Um, Bridget. Yep. Um, Anna. Yep. Liz. Gabe. Kyle. Jim. Um, Francis. Um, Marie. Yeah, you are good. Um, what are the others? Meg. Um, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I am very impressed. I think you got eight. Yes, you're so welcome. There's just that. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so Oh, good, good, good. Okay. I am so happy. Well, that was good. I know that was kind of a hard one, but I thought, well, it's always fun, right? A challenge is always fun. And now it's your turn. And I know it's, uh, hopefully I'm right on time here, but does anyone have questions for me? I'd be happy to answer if I can. I can't. Oh, well. <laughs> sure. In the picture with Kill a Mockingbird, is that your book, The Girl of the Lumber Lost? Oh, you know what? It was my mother's. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's an old, I have those books in an old, actually, a picture of my dad was in there, and the bookcase behind me, it was his bookcase. So yeah, those were my, book. yeah. Because we had that reviewed like six years ago by the gal that's coming in December. Oh, you're it kidding. Was favorite childhood book. Oh my gosh, that's fun. I'll have to remember that. Note that down. That's awesome. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, do you have much of what your dad wrote? Yeah, um, I don't have a whole lot of what my dad wrote. However, I do have a story called The Grizzly okay. that I have gotten my mom's permission. I do want to publish that into a children's book. It is an amazing story, and um, I do want to publish that. So, But unfortunately, I don't have a lot of his stories. 
So, 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 who's the better writer, you or your dad? Um, <laughs> Maybe I'm, I shouldn't ask. That. No, you can. And I am. Go well, my dad, he was a different kind of writer. I am definitely a novelist. I definitely write novels. He loved short stories. Okay. And we both wrote poetry. He was more like uh, comical, silly poetry, where mine was more serious. Um, reading my poetry today, I don't even understand it. So, you know, who knows what your brain is thinking at the time when you write. But he definitely was a short story writer. He never wrote a novel. And I have a harder time writing short stories. I like the longer. So, yeah, it was a good question. Yes? I'm just curious about the friends that you talk with that never, I mean, yeah. I'm Yeah, yeah, I knew it was coming too. And I had to talk to my sister, Candy, who's here, who's Marie in the book. Um, I had to talk to her quite a bit because I knew once I put it out, questions were going to pour in from my friends. Number one, I resigned before it came out. <laughs> that was always good. But I, however, I was asked to go back and do my launch there at BB School because all my, my, my students wanted the book and so forth. Um, yeah, it was hard. I knew once the book was out, I was going to start getting the questions and I have very close friends um, at where I taught and the questions did come out and one thing that my sister Candy said to me which I knew had to happen anyways because I, I it's the way I was raised you got to start with the truth because you can't turn around you can't turn back so when the questions came the truth came out that's what it was you know um, and it's really strange because when I first started talking about it I couldn't I was stumbling over my words it was just horrible now I don't care you know what I mean but it's such a stigma in today's society as it was back then, you know? So now I just, I love speaking at schools too because it helps. It helps those kids that are like, that it's okay. You can still grow up and be a professional and write books or whatever you wanna do. So, yeah, so good question. But it was hard, yes? Did you have trouble writing in the voice of a five-year-old? Did you have trouble being five again? Um, no, I really didn't. Those were the really easy years to remember for me, actually, from like being young to seven. Um, for the happy, playful times. But the good thing that I had, her question was, if you didn't hear, was it hard to find the voice of a five-year-old? The positive thing is, is that I'm one of 10, and I'm an aunt of about 42 nieces and nephews. Mm -hmm. So I had someone in ed every age group that I could listen to and know what their enthusiasm and what their voice sounded like. What grade did you teach? I taught first, second, and third. And then um, I subbed also in fourth and fifth. So, yeah. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, as for yourself, trying to decide what to call your book, I figured you would maybe have uh, mm -hmm. asked yourself, are there any other books written called The Fifth Floor? If so, is yours the only one? No, it's not the only one. However, it does come up first on Amazon, so that's good. <laughs> um, it is not. There is about four or five called The Fifth Floor, and but I really, once I got the title for that one, I really wanted it, and then... When I sent it to the editor, they said it was a great title for it, and I just kind of thought in the back of my mind, oh well, you know, if I have to compete it against someone else with the fifth floor, I do. But uh, like I said, it comes up first on Amazon, so that's good. <laughs> yes. Was just like Ziggy easier to write after the first book? Um, there were. It was easier in some ways and harder in another because I hadn't planned on a sequel. Telling the backstory without boring a new, telling the backstory for a new reader without boring the reader of the fifth floor. Because just like Ziggy is a standalone, however I do think it's better read with the fifth floor. Um, so that was the little bit of a hard part. But because I had the flow of the characters and their voices, that was the easier part. So, any other questions? You mentioned your um, novel sister Marie is here. Yes. Yeah, so Marie, uh, Marie, um, Candy, and this is Frances, my older sister. Yeah, so, and then my mother is over here, and she has a big part in the fifth floor, too, so she's here, too. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. How did, how did publishers get involved? Because you say you had the book, or, or books, right. but you hadn't done anything with them yet. Was the publisher involved at that point, or? Yeah, so his question was, what about publishers and how were they involved? I had the books, but I didn't have a publisher involved. So what happened is that I actually started to query when I wrote the first book and decided that I was going to publish it. 
I decided to query agents because you have to get an agent for like the big publishing companies. Um, and I was rejected over and over and over. I'm going to say 50 times and maybe those were the ones that were nice enough to send an email. Some even sent a letter. Um, and though, you know, I was rejected. So I decided to go ahead and self um, publish. That was a whole new learning curve. And I'm so glad I did. Um, so now I, I self published. People have asked me, well, now that you're kind of out there, you have a lot of good reviews. I have been awarded the Five Star Reader's Favorite Award and a couple other awards. Would you now go and query agents? And my answer is no at this point in time. I've talked to authors that have gone through the big publishing uh, companies. If you're not big, like a Stephen King or a Leanne Moriarty or whatever, you it's a three-year process. It's, you know, it's very, very slow. Um, I love getting my book out there, and it was kind of slow at first moving. But I always believed in slow and steady wins the race, and now the fifth floor moves pretty good, and just like Ziggy, and now people are anticipating the third book coming out. So it just takes time. So I am self-published and, and like it. So, And I heard traditional publishing anyways. You have to do all of your own promoting anyway, so I'm already doing that. Why not get, you know, instead of, I get 70% of what the need will cost instead of 10%. Might as well make a little bit of money. I mean, I remember my first August, I made $1.98 by the end of the month, and I came, my husband came home from work. I'm like, high five, I made $1.98 this month. <laughs> and uh, so, you know what, it's, it's slow, but it's, it's good. So, But I know the time is, is running. It's short. It's five minutes to one. So I just want to thank all of you so much. I do have my books here for purchase if you'd like them. Um, but you can also get them here at the library. Um, they're at a couple of, I know they're at uh, eight libraries around, and um, they're also online. So, but I really appreciate you uh, coming to this, and I just loved being here. So, thank you so much. You going to sign your books? Yes, I will sign books if you'd like. Um, I'd love to. Even, and the ones that I handed out are signed, but if you have one that you've already purchased and want me to sign, I'll do that.